Um, oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Well, now that we're recording, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Maggie for initially reaching out to me. Thanks, uh, Ethan and Maggie, for the introduction and just UEC in general for being an amazing organization uh, and for hosting me. So, um, as Maggie said, you know, I'm presenting just specifically on mushrooms of Wisconsin and wanted to emphasize some common wild, edible, and medicinal mushrooms. Um, so, Throughout the slide, uh, throughout the slideshow, you'll see a handful of pictures that I've gathered from the web, but also a handful of pictures I've taken myself, and I'll kind of point that out along the way. Um, without further ado, so a little bit more on me. Um, as was already mentioned, I graduated from Stevens Point. I studied natural resource planning there and soil science, which are kind of the major fields that played into my um, fascination. And, you know, with mushroom identification, basically. Uh, but I'm from Milwaukee. And so, you know, now I, now I live here and I do a lot of my mushroom hunting in southeastern Wisconsin. So I, I like to think that I bring uh, good local knowledge to this presentation. And I hope that uh, I can convey that throughout it. So I went to Shorewood High School um, and was very thankful for the bit of outdoor education I got there. It also definitely played into what has become my fascination with fungi in the Wisconsin area. And so um, more recently, I became a member of the Wisconsin Mycological Society. And if you ask me, that's well overdue. That's something I should have done four or five years ago. Um, but just for today, I kind of wanted to cover on a very basic level, what is a mushroom? Um, and before, <clears throat> before showcasing any mushrooms, I wanted to talk a little bit about the safety, sustainability and legality of harvesting wild mushrooms. And then, uh, then for the main portion of the PowerPoint, I wanted to talk about common edible and medicinal mushrooms of Wisconsin and do so in a categorized fashion. So I've, I've kind of come up with six different categories of mushrooms based on their morphology. Uh, and what I mean by morphology is basically their shape um, in very basic terms. That's, <clears throat> that's what I'm describing there. And then I'll save some time for Q&A at the end. Um, like I said earlier, you know, as we go through the PowerPoint, if you want to just put your questions into the chat, then I can kind of go through them uh, line by line afterwards. So first of all, what is a mushroom? A mushroom is the reproductive structure of a, fun of a fungi. It's usually only 5% or less of the biomass of the entire organism. So Mushroom does not equal organism. Mushroom equals like an organ of the mushroom, basically. <clears throat> and it's usually spore bearing. However, there are mushrooms that actually reproduce through something called fragmentation. So if you're familiar with like succulents or like a jade plant, um, you know, it'll break off and then regrow from that broken piece. Um, by, by budding. Um, mushrooms are connected to mycelium. That's, that's how they gain all their nutrients um, to do what they do and to grow. Um, but not all fungi have mushrooms, which is also something very good to point out. Some um, fungi have other ways of reproducing as well that, uh, that don't require a mushroom. Uh, mushrooms are also a nutritional food source for many animals and humans. And um, something here I should also include is the organisms themselves play a very essential role in the ecosystem, usually as a, usually as a decaying organism, um, breaking down both living, uh, dying, and dead material into nutrient uh, available soil 
And so in a lot of ways, it really accelerates um, the succession of a forest and in, in its development. Um, and as far as we know, uh, mushrooms have been consumed by humans for at least 13,000 years. It was an interesting factoid that I came across. Um, and obviously with, with really anything when you're going into the woods um, and collecting in the woods, especially, there's a handful of safety, sustainability and stewardship practices that you're gonna wanna be mindful of. Uh, and that first one is to comply with public land regulations. And I kinda wanna talk on this for a little bit. Um, one, this is important because those regulations are there for a reason. Uh, the people who create those regulations are, the, are working with the people who manage those landscapes. Um, and they're truly the stewards of that land. So um, when you comply with the land regulations, you too are a steward of the land um, and you're making informed decisions based on people who know more about that area than, than you do um, in most cases. Another thing on that point is in the state of Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin state parks are generally, I mean, for the vast, vast majority of scenarios, uh, you're allowed to collect and forage mushrooms as long as it's for personal use. Um, and that goes back to the stewardship and sustainability piece. So if you're ever planning on foraging wild mushrooms for commercial use, there's not really a public land option without getting some sort of a permit and good luck getting a permit for that. So you're pretty much restricted to private land. Um, and on that private land piece, you know, if, if you own the land or if you have permission from the landowner, it's kind of free reign. I mean, obviously within the permission of the landowner, constraints. Um, so a lot of people will do that for morel hunting, for example, or chanterelle hunting if, you know, their neighbor has the, the right habitat for it, maybe, and they don't. Um, and so in a lot, I'll, I'll say in Milwaukee County, it's restricted all the all the parks um, foraging. Well, the verbiage actually doesn't mention fungi, but it's pretty obvious that they mean uh, no collecting of really any plant or, or fungi in Milwaukee County Parks. Basically, the bottom line for that point is always look before you go harvesting, always look at the um, parks regulations. So the next point I have here is be aware of ticks and poisonous plants that are common. I mean, and this just goes for hiking in the woods in general, but mushroom hunters, uh, mushroom foragers are some of the most common people to go in for Lyme's disease. And this recently actually happened to me. Um, so I have to say that, you know, um, surprisingly, I, I've encountered ticks my whole life. I've been going up north since a kid, since I was a kid. And all of a sudden, you know, out of the blue earlier this season, I got a tick bite, I got the bullseye rash, and I went in three days later to go get it checked out. Maggie actually helped me, helped convince me to go in. Um, and sure enough, they diagnosed it as Lyme's disease. I got on antibiotics right away and was able to treat it in two weeks, uh, a little over two weeks time. So big thing there is, um, if you get bit by a tick, it's smart to keep the tick because they can actually test the tick itself for Lyme's disease in the, in the ER or wherever you go. And um, another thing is, yeah, I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but basically um, they can identify it, then it's only deer ticks. So just be out, you know, brush yourself up on these things, poison ivy, we don't have a lot of poison oak in the state, but uh, it's my understanding that we do have some, I think closer to the Mississippi. So just be aware of those things. Um, cow parsnip's another one, but probably don't have to worry too much about that. Um, oops. And then 
Uh, positively identify anything before eating it. Um, now there might be situations where you're like 90% sure and the mushrooms that are growing in that area are abundant and you wanna take a specimen back to um, do a spore print, let's say, or basically continue to identify that mushroom. Um, that's okay, you know, but for the most part, you don't want to basically don't consume anything without a hundred percent positively ide identifying it first. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, learn the proper pre preparation from credible sources as well. So I'll give an example for this one. And my example is the common morel mushroom. Um, if you don't cook morels, they're actually slightly toxic. And so uh, not a lot of people know that because they're such a common edible, but this is true about a lot of different mushrooms. Um, and so for the most part, a good, a good rule of thumb. And now when I say rule of thumb, I, I recognize I'm generalizing. I'm very careful with saying rules of thumbs, but you want to, you want to eat a small amount when trying something for the first time after positively IDing it, of course. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're cooking it and cooking it well. Um, and you also wanna make sure that you're cleaning it well. Uh, another thing is you wanna harvest young specimens free of mold. And sometimes there's uh, some bugs that maybe have gotten to it. And you wanna be conscious of, you know, how, how degraded that mushroom is before you pick it. Um, Couple other things on here, as far as sustainability goes, avoid sensitive habitats. Um, or if you're aware that this species is a rare species um, or you know not, not very abundant, that may be just something to leave uh, for the enjoyment of others and for the genetic preservation of that species in the area. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Um, you wanna use a sharp knife to leave the substrate intact as well. Some people when they're first learning, they like to just pull up the mushroom. And for some mushrooms, that's fine because it, it's a clean break, but for other mushrooms, you might pull up some mycelium and actually disturb the, uh, the mycelial growth underneath. It's just a good practice. Um, leave no trace, store your mushrooms properly so that they don't get moldy afterwards usually drying or freezing if you don't cook them within a few days. All right, that's a lot on this slide. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say on that poisonous plant and just identification piece is I always, always, always recommend looking up poisonous lookalikes. It's definitely the first place I almost always start when I'm IDing a, a mushroom. Um, because if you don't know how to identify the poisonous lookalike, then you don't know how to make the, this, you don't know how to distinguish the two. And then you're not in, a, you're not in a safe zone for consuming that. So um, now just to get into a handful of common wild and edible, uh, edible and medicinal mushrooms in Wisconsin. So first polypore mushrooms, uh, let me talk on that. Polypore mushrooms are, Mushrooms that usually grow on trees, um, they're usually known as shelf mushrooms. However, there are some, some ground mushrooms, we'll say, that also exhibit a polyporous, um, a polyporous underside to the cap is what I'll say for now. And so what, what does polypore mean? It means many pores. So usually we're talking about thousands of little tiny holes that drop spores. And that's really all it is. So without further ado, two um, very common wild edible mushrooms in the state are these two species of chicken of the woods mushroom, otherwise known as uh, Latoporus species. So yeah, real quick for each one of these slides, I'm gonna start with that scientific name because that I'm just trying to really hammer in how important it is to, uh, to use those species level naming. Um, 
basically because you might have two species in the same genus and one of them is toxic and one of them's not. Um, so it's just important to, to kind of nail it down to that level. Um, but either way, the two most, there are three species of Lataporus in Wisconsin. Lataporus is the genus, but there are two common ones that I'd like to talk about today. That's Lataporus sulfurus, which uh, I run into more often and has yellow pores underneath. Uh, that's what I have pictured here. And then Lataporus cincinnatus, which has white pores underneath. Um, both mushrooms are rich in potassium, vitamin C, fiber, and vitamin A, and are believed to have antifungal and antibiotic properties. They're also saprophytic. Um, in other words, they're saprotroph. And what does that mean? That means that they get their nutrients by secreting enzymes into dead and dying material um, to break it down and, and use it. Um, so that's, it's living off of dead and dying uh, hardwoods in most cases. So hardwoods, think broadleaf trees, you know, non-conifers. I think most people in, in this uh, audience here have that level of understanding, I believe. Um, so yeah, what else did I want to say on this one, um, is personally, a lot of people love to eat this one. They say it tastes like chicken, you know, it looks like chicken because it's got this feathering pattern to it. Um, now I've, I've collected both of these species and I personally have found that especially the older specimens that are a little more fibrous, a little more tough, um, don't really settle so well in my stomach. Now it's not like a horrible indigestion or anything like that, but it's noticeable. And I wouldn't say that's true about the younger specimens. So if you find them when they're really young or if you're able to harvest just kind of the outer fresher part of the mushroom, that's gonna be a little bit more digestible for most people. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I've also th thought that the white board chicken of the woods, um, later part of Cincinnati is a little bit tastier and more digestible. Um, that's just my personal opinion. And then there's Ganoderma suge, which is um, kind of the Midwestern reishi is what a lot of people kind of refer to it as. A lot of you have probably heard of reishi because of its commercial um, value. And basically it's an alternative medicine for a lot of reasons. And it uh, was used in ancient Chinese medicine, or sorry, not, not this specific species, but a very closely related species was used in ancient Chinese medicine for thousands of years. And um, this species is being researched more and more. And it's being discovered that it shares a lot of the sim similar properties to uh, this other one, which is Ganoderma lucid, uh, lucidium. However, this is Ganoderma suge, and it's called suge because uh, that comes from the, the hemlock scientific name. And this mushroom grows specifically on hemlock trees, which is huge as far as identification goes. If you can narrow it down to that, um, there's not a whole lot of other species that look like this and that grow on hemlock trees. Another big identifying characteristic is the glossiness. Um, in other words, like the varnish look that is on, on the surface of this mushroom. And it's also got a, a long stipe. And a, a stipe is another word for stem, basically. You can see that dark red stem in this picture. Um, and as they get older, they turn darker red. This is also a saprotroph um, being studied, studied for anti-cancer and anti-tumor, rich in vitamins, proteins, and carbohydrates, and has also been used um, for wound healing. So even people will take like a powder and put it underneath a natural bandage, things like that. Um, so this is, this is one of my favorite mushrooms in Wisconsin. I think it's really, really cool that we have this growing here. Uh, usually, uh, usually it's, I just wanna say, 
because of the hemlock distribution in the state, usually it's found in northern parts of the state, but I've seen on iNaturalist, people have found it down, I think, closer to like Fond du Lac and out near Madison, which probably as far as south as you're going to find it, um, as far as I, I'm concerned. Here's another one of my favorites. Um, this one's edible and medicinal, which makes it really unique. Uh, this is Griffola frondosa. Again, this is a polypore. Uh, this is hen of the woods or maitake. Uh, maitake is the Japanese word, or that's what the Japanese word mainly is for it in cuisine. And it's got a white pore surface that you can't really see in this picture. There's not, I mean, there's a couple other things that look like this, but not a whole lot of other species in Wisconsin that truly look like this. Uh, have the feathering pattern and have that kind of grayish brown color. They usually grow in pretty big clusters at the base of oak trees, usually very mature oak trees. Um, I think they're delicious. I make, I make mushroom jerky out of them. Uh, they marinate really well and then you can dehydrate them. And so this is a really fun one to find. I think it's also really good with like pasta and you know you can cook it down with like white wine and butter and it's just magnificent it's super delicious um the medicinal value i wasn't able to find a whole lot specifically on it but it's being studied for heart health cancer support immune system support and diabetes management um which you'll see a lot of those uh same things across these medicinal mushrooms which is pretty interesting. Um, this one has a little bit of debate behind it too. Scientists aren't quite quite sure if it's saprophytic or parasitic. So what's the what's the big debate there? Really, what does that mean? It means is it getting its nutrients from dead wood and dying wood, or from living from a living parasite, or sorry, from a living host? A little early. Um, and yeah, that is still not quite determined. Usually when I find it, the tree seems to be living. I'll just say that. Uh, usually a living mature oak. So uh, on to the next category, we have bolete mushrooms, which bolete mushrooms also have a polypore bottom, except they are, we'll say ground mushrooms and not tree mushrooms. So. Um, I'll start with uh, kind of the most common bolete mushroom, which grows here in Wisconsin, and it's known as the king bolete, or many people refer to it as porcini in the kind of culinary area. Um, but then again, a lot of boletes will just be called porcinis by people who are using it for culinary reasons. and not truly identifying the species exactly. So um, Boletus edulis is unique um, because it can get huge. Basically, like in, in the most extreme cases, uh, you can have a smooth cap that is up to 16 inches in diameter. And so you can just imagine what that would look like uh, if you stumbled across that, you know, walking through the forest and you look down, this thing's a foot and a half almost wide. Uh, they like to grow in summer and autumn. Uh, they're, now I'm only bringing this up because of the next slide, uh, it's this poor thing. I wasn't gonna get to this, this level of detail, but it's got white to greenish yellow pores. You can kind of see in this picture and uh, that's gonna help distinguish it from the next slide. Um, boletes, this bolete and the next one are high in proteins, uh, vitamins, minerals, and dietary fiber. Um, and now this is also going to distinguish it from the next one. It is mycorrhizal, but mostly with conifer trees and also chestnut, beech, and oak trees. So this one's great if you can find it. I personally, I've never found it and harvested it. I think I've found it before I knew it was edible. And I have a picture from that. So this is an interesting one. I, I know it's around though. 
Now, this next one here, Boletus Seperans. This is one that I did found. I took these pictures. Um, it's known as the lilac bolete. It's got a wrinkled cap up to eight inches in diameter, and that would be considered a large specimen. Um, it's got a buff to purplish brown cap. And uh, you can you can kind of see that in this picture. I have another couple pictures on the next slide too that'll help identify some of this. But one of the coolest parts, in my opinion, a big distinguishing factor for this one is the white netted stipe or stem. Um, and you can kind of, I'll, I'll show you in the next picture of a really good, next slide, I have a really good picture. Um, and you can see that it has these really light tones of lilac color kind of throughout the stem and uh, the cap too. It's a close relative to Boletus edulis. However, a huge difference is it only, or mostly only has mycorrhizal association with oaks. And I just realized I did not describe what a mycorrhizal relationship is. So I'm gonna take a second to do that. Um, a mycorrhizal relationship is more symbiotic in nature. It's when a mushroom um, exchanges nutrients with a living tree species usually almost always it's a tree species, but it could be used to describe that relationship with a plant species too. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, there's, there's some really interesting things that like, I know I was reading with Boletus edulis, it actually helps certain tree species um, with like, like, if there's like a drought, those, those saplings that are in association with the boletes, they can like, they're more tolerant to the drought. They're able to like withhold more water. I don't know, know how it works, but I thought that was fascinating. Um, so yeah, there's, I know the trees are usually supplying carbon uh, back to the mushrooms but there's a lot of detail in that and every species is gonna be different. So um, these are the pictures I wanted to show you about Boletus seprons. Uh, on the left, I thought that was a pretty cool cross section. I was just, just went to cook it and I was like, wow, that looks really cool. Um, so I wanted to show that kind of what the inside of this mushroom looks like. And then on the right side, you can see that white netted stipe. Um, the netted, I mean, that's just referring to this texture on the stipe here. So I thought that was really neat. Um, now on the guild mushrooms, I wanted, I wanted to go, okay, so there's uh, so many guild mushrooms, uh, some that grow on trees, some that grow on the ground. I mean, out of all the mushrooms, these are probably the most abundant um, and I just wanted to focus on a couple that are common, edible, and easy, um, and don't have a whole lot of poisonous lookalikes. So this is the pearl oyster mushroom, um, better known as Pleurotus ostriatus. Um, one thing with all oyster mushrooms is you have something called decurrent gills. That's a big identifying factor. And what does that mean? That means that the gills run into the stem and they kind of slowly fade off in the stem, um, which you can kind of see in that top, top right photo there. You can see how they go right into that centralized point, which is where it actually is coming out of the tree. Um, they're often in clusters uh, and you'll find them on either dead or dying trees. So sometimes it's standing, sometimes it's fallen. Uh, it's also a sapotroph. So it's helping break down that dead woody material uh, with its enzymes. And then it um, especially likes deciduous trees and beech trees in particular, American beech. Um, one really cool thing about this is Pleurotus ostratus uh, is known to have carnivorous mycelia. So again, mycelium is kind of, for lack of 
uh, without getting into it too much, it's kind of like the roots of a mushroom. They're usually a lot sm smaller though, and they secrete enzymes. That's how they break down wood. Um, it's also how this mushroom is able to break down and digest nematoda, and that makes it carnivorous. And uh, it's able to uptake nitrogen from those nematodes, which is pretty wild, um, pretty cool. And usually when I find them, there's some nematodes living right in between the gills and they can be hard to get out sometimes, but you know, it's, uh, it's food for everybody. So I'm always happy to see them there. Anyways, uh, another cool thing about this is, I don't remember the chemical, but there's a chemical that resembles almond flavor in this species, which is pretty cool. And it has, this chemical called lovastatin in it, which is used commercially to lower cholesterol. Um, and that's pretty cool. So if you find this in nature, you know, you can provide that medicine to yourself. Um, and then another oyster species that I thought was a key of key interest is Pleurotus um, citro, uh, citrinopiliatus. Pleurotus citrinopiliatus. And that is the golden oyster mushroom. Again, it's got decurrent gills and often in clusters. Usually you're gonna find this one in way bigger clusters as you can see in these pictures. Um, so it shares a lot of a lot in common with Pleurotus ostratus, but it's quite different in the fact that it's um, very, it's very aggressive. It's also an invasive species and non-native. So honestly, you know, if I was the one making the rules, I don't think you should have a problem harvesting this one anywhere, but I'm not the land manager. I'm not the one who sets the regulations. And, um, you know, you should still follow the, the land use regulations for sure in each part. However, this one is, I mean, it has started to become more and more abundant just in the past, like five to 10 years. In Wisconsin, uh, there was like not really a whole lot of, I don't think there's any sightings of it, like even in the 90s. So this is new. Um, but that doesn't make it bad. You know, just because something's invasive and non native doesn't mean it's bad. It's still working to um, break down the woody material, the dead and dying woody material in the forest and accelerating decomposition, which accelerates succession, which is just typically great for the overall health of a forest. So it's great in that way. It's great that it's a food source, both for humans and for other animals that's rich in antioxidants and can potentially lower blood sugar. So, I mean, right, not all, just because something's invasive non-native doesn't mean that it isn't also great. However, whenever I see this, you know, I'm always, I don't feel any shame in harvesting it because I, I know you can see how aggressive it is and that it could outcompete other mushrooms for the available woody substrate. And that's something I think about. Um, this one's of particular interest. Uh, the last guild mushroom I'll go through is uh, one that I just think is awesome that we have this in the state of Wisconsin. It's called the saffron milk cap or lactarius delici or deliciosus. <laughs> um, because it's delicious. And it's a choice edible mushroom. This one's not so easy to find. Um, when you do find it, it's in a mycorrhizal relationship with conifers usually, uh, especially Eastern white pine. It has a depressed cap with concentric rings around it. As when I say depressed cap, I just mean that the center of the cap goes down. Um, and concentric rings, meaning like rings inside of rings inside of rings, which you can kind of see, especially towards the outer edge of the cap. Um, obviously this bright orange color, it's kind of, this is kind of hard to mistake with other mushrooms. Um, right away, you're probably wondering, well, why is it called milk cap? It exudes a latex, uh, a milky latex. And in this case, that milky latex is, saffron colored. Now there's 
there's some more yellow looking, um, like there's a golden milk cap that looks pretty close to this, but a big characteristic that distinguishes it is the color of that milk. So like the milky latex in that other lookalike is white. Um, in this one, it's very obviously like a yellowish or like a gold, a gold color. Um, and yeah, people really, I mean, this is something to get really excited about if you find it, because like I said, it's not all that easy to find. Um, but if you have the right place, then you can go back to it year after year. Uh, and they, they, yeah, so I would go up north to find this one is basically what I'm saying. Um, late summer through fall, and it's got a fruity aroma. Um, on to some of my favorites, chanterelles and trumpets, also known as gomphoid mushrooms, which is basically just the order that, they, uh, that they're in and kind of the morphology category. So instead of talking about specific species, I just kind of wanted to talk about Cantharalis genus because there are so many chanterelles and Typically, it's this genus that's thought of as the chanterelle. Um, however, that word gets tossed around a lot and does not always align with what we know taxonomically. Um, so a couple common ones are Cantharalis siberius and Cantharalis cinnabarinus. Um, these I've found in Wisconsin both. Um, I'll find Cantharalis siberius uh, more often. Um, they're usually orange, yellow, or white. This is, this camp, the bottom right picture is about as red as they'll get. Like, I mean, that's why it's got kind of the cinnamon uh, species name. That's what it's referring to is like cinnamon look. Um, usually they're meaty in texture and funnel shaped. Um, this is kind of very similar to the milk cap. It's kind of has a depressed cap. Uh, but what makes it very different is it doesn't have real gills. It has false gills that um, appear to be decurrent. So they're not actually gills, they're ridges and they run down the stem. They kind of fade into the stem. Um, they have mycorrhizal association with conifers um, or hardwoods, depending on the species. I've found them, you know, in association with oaks before. Um, and then, but also with, I mean, conifers is much more often, often the case. Um, and you'll usually find them between summer and fall. They're usually very rich and they're known to be very rich in vitamin D kind of across the board. And they, one way I like to identify them, I mean, every time I pick a, a chanterelle, I always smell it because it has a very faint apricot aroma to it. And once you pick it up, once you smell it the first time, it's like, you'll smell it every time after that, I swear. But then, you know, I'll, I'll pass it over to whoever I'm with. I'll, Do you smell the apricot? Uh... <laughs> Not so sure. Um, so it's interesting. I think it's something you pick up on over time. Here's um, me with a handful of um, Cantharalis phasmatis, which I didn't actually know this until just like a few days ago when I was looking into this, but it wasn't until 2013 that this species was identified as being separate from I'll go back one slide, the Cantharalis siberius one. So this golden chanterelle up here, uh, the top right picture, that's what they used to think these chanterelles were part of. And these chanterelles are actually different. Um, there's a really interesting article from 2013 where they, they're like, yeah, we actually found three different species that have formerly been considered to be that one species. So. Um, it's interesting. These are the ones I found around oaks. Uh, so Cantharalis phasmatis, oak associations, um, definitely true. <clears throat> now, this is the only poisonous one I'm going to bring up. I just want you to get eyes on it because there's no way I was going to go through this presentation and not talk about chanterelles. And there's no way I can 
talk about them without talking about the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Um, it's called the jack-o'-lantern mushroom because it glows in the dark. If you see it glow in the dark, it's not a chanterelle. If you see it glow in the dark, don't eat it. Um, it's just typically not a good idea, uh, or at least in Wisconsin, um, because this is a fairly poisonous mushroom. It's not gonna kill you, but it's gonna cause severe um, intestinal distress and probably vomiting and the whole, probably like, you know, food poisoning. So um, it's known as omphalate, it doesn't really matter. Um, I just want you to be able to identify it. So it has real gills, it glows in the dark. It usually grows in massive clusters um, on dead wood and on decaying stumps. Yeah, that's where I've seen it before is on buried roots and decaying stumps. Here's more pictures of it. These are pictures I took. And this is what I mean. I mean, they, they're in dense clusters. You can see it's at the base of a tree. And um, yeah, so the big things here are is it glows in the dark and it has real gills. If, if a mushroom has real gills, it's not a chanterelle. Okay, just wanted, wanted to cover that. Um, here's a really cool picture I found uh, from this Kenosha article. I've, I've found these before, but they were all dried up and mostly moldy. Uh, so it wasn't really a photogenic opportunity. Um, plus my camera was pretty bad at the time. So this is Crater Alice phallax, also known as the black trumpet. It lacks gills, but has wrinkles. Um, it's easily preserved because usually I mean, pretty thin, so you, you can dry them out pretty well. They have a rich smoky flavor and they're known to grow in mycorrhizal association with beech, oak, and other hardwoods. Um, and they usually only get to be about four inches tall. They can be pretty hard to spot, but once you see one, there's bound to be more in the area. Um, so on to toothed mushrooms. I know I'm kind of getting close to time here. Um, I'm gonna try and cruise th through these, but there's the heresium species. Um, there's three main types in Wisconsin, lion's mane, which you've probably heard of. Then there's also bear's head and combs tooth mushroom. And I've listed them in that order from left to right on this slide. Um, they're all beautiful mushrooms. This is one, when I find one, I'm so giddy because they're typically pretty hard to find in Wisconsin. They really like beech trees though, which is something I, did not really have as a hard fact in my head um, until preparing for this presentation. So thank you. Um, you can see in the top right, this is a specimen of comb tooth mushroom that I found. Um, so yeah, lion's mane is Heresium arenaceus, bear's head is Heresium abates, and comb tooth is Heresium coralloides. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about Heracium arenaceus because it's the most well-documented of the three as far as scientific research goes. Uh, it's edible and medicinal. It is usually found in late summer to fall uh, and usually on beach or hardwoods. It has two phytochemicals that are unique to it called, her uh, let's see if I can do this, hericinones, hericinones and Aranacines, Aranacines. Um, and they are being studied for prevention against dementia because of their neural, it's called neural growth factor, NGF, their ability to stimulate neural growth factor, um, which is really interesting. And this species in particular uh, was used in traditional Chinese medicine, similar to like that Ganoderma species we were looking at before. So this is really cool that it grows in Wisconsin that uh, we have this available to us. Then there's Hiddenum rapandum, which is the hedgehog mushroom. Uh, people think of it as the safer ch chanterelle because once you see these, it grows in the same habitat. And once you see these tooth gill type things, there's nothing else that really is gonna resemble this mushroom. So it's a very safe uh, edible mushroom and usually grows in mycorrhizal 
relationship with a variety of conifers or hardwoods, usually scattered and sometimes in fairy rings. You can find it from summer to fall. Now, for my last two slides, I wanted to cover um, a cup fungi species and a morel, or just morels kind of in general, uh, which I won't spend too much time on, I swear. Um, so here we have Sarcoscypha cocinea, which is scarlet elf cup. This is a picture I took. This is up north, um, Manaqua area. It's edible, but doesn't really taste like a whole lot. If anything, it's just a really cool thing to have on the plate. And you can put like some other little foraged herbs inside of it and make a little bouquet and people love that. But um, then there's, it's also, it was used as medicine by Oneida people and some other tribes, uh, Ur Ur Iroquois tribes as well. And they would grind it up into a powder and put it under bandages to help heal wounds. And I was looking at some scientific research on that. Very interesting. Uh, the red comes from five different carotenoid pigments, which is really interesting. Um, and it's a saprotroph usually growing in, uh, in clustered clusters on buried sticks. Um, so windy areas is the key to this one. It also is a very early spring mushroom. This one is one of the few that will come up before morels, actually. So a lot of people say, if you see this, spring is here. Um, moving on to very common, I'm gonna end with the morel. So Marcella species, Marcella is the genus. Um, we have a variety of different species and then even Beneath that, there are subspecies all within the state of Wisconsin. So instead of going into that detail, I'd like to just give a couple notes on the genus. Um, it's probably the most popular edible. It kind of has that claim to fame. Um, it has mycorrhizal associations with elm, ash, apple, aspen, tulip poplar, oak, and, and more, but those are the big ones. And it really depends on which species you're talking about. But uh, in Wisconsin, the season is late April to early June, depending on where you are and what the temperature has been like. Uh, there, are so, there are many, many variables that change depending on the species and how far along the season is. Um, and yeah, there's probably a ton of questions on, on that alone. But I'm just gonna wrap it up there. Uh, with the, with the showcasing, I, I wanted to quickly put this picture up here um, because a lot of people, they like to use like different groups, you know, take, when you, when you take pictures of a mushroom for identification, you just kind of want to follow these rules. You want to make sure that you have a picture of it in its undisturbed habitat. You want a picture of the spore bearing surface um, with the stipe attached, which is the stem. And you'd, Ideally, get a picture of the mushroom, including the base. Uh, that's not always so necessary, but it's good. And then a cross section is, can be really helpful, especially when you're identifying like boletes. Um, cross sections are really helpful. So that's, that's it. Thank you so much for allowing me to present uh, about mushrooms in Wisconsin to you. And um, like to open it up for any questions. I have a lot more sources I'm going to add to this and then I will share this PowerPoint out to everybody. Um.